Marge Potasik was searching for the purpose of her life and the truth that would tie everything together to make sense of what was taught and what was happening on our planet, the fire that was creating all the smoke. Through many experiences, she was finally led to the knowledge book that provided all the answers. She is now talking about this gift to humanity on Knowledge Book Radio, so all can be united in peace, love, and harmony. Please call one 973 787-7035 or email mmjp99 at gmail.com with questions. If you send your postal address to mmjp99 at gmail.com, you will receive three chapters of the knowledge book as a gift. Now, here is your host, Marge Patasik. Hello, everyone. I'm Marge Batazic, and you're listening to Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Batazic on Transformation Talk Radio. And this is the fourth Tuesday of the month, and therefore we will continue with our Omega conferences that we've been doing for quite a while now. So for those who are just joining, and maybe as a review for the people who have been listening, a little explanation. Now, the omega dimension is the 19th dimension, and it is at the 76th energy level. Now, this dimension has been completely closed to humanity up until now, but it has now been opened to humanity um, through the knowledge book. None of the previous sacred texts carried this frequency as this was closed. The other name for the Omega dimension is the Union of Central Suns, and this is a unification dimension. And eventually all of us, when we follow the path design, will be unified at the Omega dimension. Now, up till now, the highest dimension and the highest energy that was given to humanity is the Alpha dimension, the dimension of love, which is the 18th dimension, evolution dimension, and the 72nd energy level. The Omega dimension is the 19th dimension and has been open to humanity with the knowledge book. The Omega talks are given once a month on a wide variety of topics. And the knowledge that is being given is actually linked to the Union of Central Suns, otherwise known as Omega. And all of these programs, both the religious text, the sacred text, and the knowledge book, is part of the Alpha Entrance Omega Exit Project. Now, in addition, the talks that are given are charged with Omega Energy, which of course now we know it is the dimension of unification. And those who participate in the talk form a reflection magnetic field the Omega dimension is open to the whole world, and this helps people to achieve positive consciousness. So anyone who takes part in an Omega talk is actually doing a great service to humanity. Since everyone on the planet, even those who are not reading the knowledge book, are able to receive the positive Omega energies. Now the topic for this month, since we've entered January the 1st, month of the new year, we thought that we could talk about milestones. Those markers in our evolution on the world dimension that um, changed the way we think, the way we do things, and how things proceed. Now, there's the difference between discoveries and inventions. Discovery as the definition is the act of process of seeing, finding, or gaining knowledge of something previously unknown. Discoveries can have various impacts on society, on culture, on science, on technology, and on the environment. In contrast, an invention is a unique or novel device, method, composition, idea, or process that did not exist before. So a discovery is something that we don't know that was there and we find it, while invention is something that wasn't there and we actually create it. Now, in terms of milestone itself, the original meaning was a actual stone on a road 
and mark the distance in miles to or from a particular location. But however, over time, the meaning expanded to encompass an action or an event marking a significant change or stage of the development. For example, walking is considered a major milestone in childhood development. So we'll go through the list of human inventions, something that wasn't there, but we created. So human inventions and technologies have shaped civilization and transformed life on Earth. As expectations and capabilities evolve, each generation cultivates its, cultivates its innovative, innovative thinkers, from harnessing the power of fire and electricity to the development of the World Wide Web. The following discoveries are some of the milestones that transformed life on Earth. So here we have some of the inventions that happened. Oops. And of course, on the bottom here, we have the Range Rover on Mars. So you went from the Earth to outside of planet Earth. Now, fire, of course, is a natural phenomenon. However, humans discovered it could be a useful tool, and this marks a revolution in human history and one of our most powerful early discoveries. It radically changed the way our ancient ancestors lived. The campfire was a social gathering place offering warmth and the ability to cook foods. Fire also provided some protection against predators. Now, according to a heavily debated hypothesis, using fire for cooking allowed the larger brain of our species to develop by allowing hominids to eat a wider, wider variety of foods. The second thing we'll cover is tools. Now this discovery, or actually this invention, is a very ancient invention and dates to maybe 3.3 million years ago. Today, several animal species are also known to use tools. Animals such as chimpanzees, apes, uh, crows, ants, they all use tools. Anthropologists believe using tools was an essential step in the evolution of humans. Some of the earliest tools may have been sticks, stones, and fire. And over thousands of years, tools have evolved from a simple hand tools to complex power tools. Concrete. Concrete is actually the most widely used building material of today. It's a composite material made from a mixture of broken stone or gravel, sand, Portland cement, and water. And this can be either poured or spread into molds to form a mass resembling stone as it hardens. One of the concrete's key ingredients is cement. And this was supposed to be, this was probably devised in 1300 BC. And cement itself is a mixture of lime and volcanic ash that slowly reacts in the presence of water to form a very hard mass. And of course, the Romans are the ones that are famous for their concrete. And even though the structures have been built 2,000 years ago, they are still standing today. Where before we had wooden structures or tents, um, Cement allowed structures to be taller, so you had, could do build a building more than three stories, more than four stories. They're also stronger, they're very resistant to fire, and they're very long lasting. Eventually, concrete was reinforced with iron bars and later steel, and that allowed the building of skyscrapers. So we went from a three or four or five, even five story building that may have been composed of wood. Now we're building 110 story buildings. That's a composite of steel and concrete. Steel itself is the foundation of our buildings, vehicles, and industries. 
with its rates of production and consumption often seen as markers for a nation's development. It is the most is the it is the world's most used metal and most recycled material, with 1951 million metric tons of crude steel produced in 2021. The precursor to steel was cast iron. And cast iron had about two to four percent of carbon. And this was made in China first around 500 BC. Chinese metal workers burnt large furnaces to smelt iron ore into a liquid and poured this into carved molds. Around 400 BC, Indian metal workers invited, invented a smelting method that used a clay receptacle called a crucible to hold the molten metal. The workers put bars of wrought iron and pieces of charcoal into the crucibles and then sealed the containers and inserted them into the furnace. One thing to remember is that with concrete, concrete is hard as stone. You can build tall structures. However, at a certain point, concrete itself cannot take the pressure of the stone above it because it becomes too much and the concrete below begins to crack. And that's why the steel is used to reinforce it so that cracking does not happen. So this wrought iron that was melted and absorbed the carbon and the charcoal, and when the crucibles cooled, they contain ingots, ingots of pure steel, a much stronger or less brittle metal than iron. If, as you know, iron itself is easily corroded. It becomes oxidized in the in air, in water. So steel doesn't have that characteristics. It, it retains its strength and form even under very stressful situations of heat and water. Mass production of steel changed the landscape with the introduction of rails, both for cable cars and railroads, in cars, in product manufacturing, farm equipment, skyscrapers, etc. Now we take this one for granted most of the time. You just go to the store, buy a packet, come home, and put a nail in the wall or whatever we're building. It is maybe one of the most important and underrated invention. Before the invention of nails, wood structures were often built using rope to interlock adjacent boards. Some cultures develop sophisticated woodworking techniques to interlock wooden structures together. But this is a very arduous and hard process. You have to be very exact to be able to then merge those two boards together. As an else, oh, there is no firm evidence of when the first metal nails were developed. Bronze nails dating from around 3400 BC have been found in Egypt. Over time, these were replaced by iron and steel with most nails being made by hand. Until of course, the 1790s and the early 1800s where the handmade, nail, handmade nails were no longer in use because they were produced mass produced and become became very common so common that we take them for granted now electricity of course is another natural phenomenon and if we look around us everything around us actually runs on electricity we are now on the internet can't have the internet without electricity at night we need the light to be able to study to work to live it has become the basic need for daily life and is another essential discovery. Long before his famous kite experiment, Benjamin Franklin had speculated that lightning was electricity. His revolutionary idea was to conduct electricity safely into the ground to save buildings from fires. So he's what he thought of as putting an iron rod attached to the roof of or the highest point of a building, connecting that rod to an iron, to a wire, metal wire, and putting that wire in the ground. 
And if lightning struck the building, it would strike that iron rod. The iron rod would con then conduct the electricity through the wire into the ground and therefore preserving the house and not causing fires. It's a natural phenomenon, but the practical application produce and, effect and effectively use it first needed to be invented. So something is there, but how do you, how do you, other than waiting for lightning, how do you get electricity to be readily available for use? So Alessandro Volta is generally credited with discovering the first practical battery. He invented his voltaic pile in 1799. It consisted of disks of two different metals, such as copper and zinc, separated by cardboard soaked in brine. So basically what the, uh, the battery is, stored energy, stored electricity. In 1831, British scientist Michael Faraday discovered the basic principles of electricity generation. The electromagnetic induction discovery revolutionized energy usage. The rise in electricity usability is now the backbone of modern industrial society. So basically he connected, he found that as long as you have a magnet and a wire going through that magnet and whether the magnet rotates or the wire is called around the magnet, then you produce electricity. There is a movement of electrons and therefore that those electrons can then be used to a forever purpose um, if it's necessary. Now, the invention of the light bulb transformed our world by removing our dependence on natural light, firelight, and candles, allowing us to be productive at any time of day or night. Previously, people would rise with the sunrise, go to sleep with sunset, and if anything was done indoors or anywhere, you need either a torch or a campfire or candles inside the home. The light we use in our homes and offices today comes from a bright idea from over 150 years ago. Electric lights were pioneered in the early 19th century by Humphrey Davy, who experimented with electricity and invented an electric battery. When he connected wires between his battery and a piece of carbon, the carbon glowed, producing light. His invention was known as the electric arc lamp. Over the next seven decades, other inventors also created light bulbs, but these were incapable of commercial application. So basically, even though the idea for a light bulb was there and some method of creating light was there, however, to produce a light bulb commercially has still to be developed. Now in 1850, English physicist Joseph Wilson Swan created a light bulb by enclosing carbonized paper filaments in an evacuated glass bulb. But to do this, he had to have a good vacuum, which was not available at the time. So the bulb had a very short lifetime for commercial use. However, in the 1870s, better vacuum pumps became available and Swan developed a longer lasting light bulb. Thomas as Alpha Edison improved on Swan's design by using metal filaments. And in 1878 and 1879, he filed patents for electric lights using different materials for the filaments. The electric light company began marketing its new product, the light bulb. And this was a mass produced um, light bulb that then people had easy access to. and the battery again. The invention of the battery led to the development of all modern electrical equipment. The earliest device based on the principles of what would become the battery may date back 2000 years to the Perth Parthian Empire. The old battery consisted of a clay jar filled with a vinegar solution into which an iron a rod surrounded by a copper cylinder was inserted. This device might have been used to electrophate silver, but as mentioned, the inventor of the first electric battery was Alessandro Volta, who developed the PAL battery.
So the structure of the battery basically it's something that allows the electrons to to move. So the the position of the metals in the battery basically allow the electrons to move, and that's the stored energy that is then being used to power whatever device we have. In 1800, William Quickshank designed the tough the trough battery, an improvement on Alessandro Volta's voltaic pile. In 1859, the first rechargeable battery based on lead acid by the French physician Gaston Planté was invented. The nickel cadmium battery was introduced in 1899 by Waldemar Jungner. Today, batteries have become very small to the power our modern devices. Engineers at Rice University have developed a battery 60,000 times smaller than the conventional AAA battery, the AAA. It is only 5.5 microns or half of one millionth of a centimeter, of a meter actually. And it's 150 nanometers thick. Now a nanometer is one billionth with a B of a meter. It's amazing the size that they have come down to. Excuse me. And now we have the robot. Now robots allow complicated, repetitive, and sometimes dangerous tasks to be performed without causing danger to humans. The word itself first appeared in Rossum's Universal Robots which was a play written by Czech playwright Karl Čapek in 1921. Coincidentally, the word robotics was popularized by science fiction writer Isaac Asimov in his short story Roundabout, Runabout, published in 1942. Robots themselves have a very long history. Around 3000 BC, mechanical human figurines were used to strike the hour bells in an Egyptian water clock. This marked the first mechanical design. As time passed, more designs and devices evolved. The foundation for the modern robots was laid in 1950s by George C. Devil, inventor and patent holder of a reprogrammable manipulator called Unimate. In the 19, in late 1960, Joseph Engelberger acquired the patent to the Unimate and modified it into an industrial robot. For this, he is known as the father of robotics. Robotics has expanded to various fields, such as medicine, space, military, agriculture, and entertainment, with diverse applications and challenges. So most, most very repetitive tasks, such as um, constructing cars on a conveyor belt that used to be um, done by human labor, now is done by robots. So humans are then freed from factory jobs and they can pursue other yeah, other jobs and other means of uh, living. The transformation of transportation. A transporta transportation itself is the movement of people and goods from one place to another. Transportation is constantly evolving and adapting to the needs and desires of people and society and has been transformed by many discoveries and inventions throughout history, such as the wheel. The wheel itself is an original engineering marvel and one of the most famous inventions. And it could be actually the most important invention made by humans. It made travel easier, but is also the foundation for numerous other innovative technologies. However, Although the wheel was invented in Mesopotamia around 3500 BC,
the people had made metal alloys, built canals and sailboats and made complicated instruments like harps. The wheel itself wasn't the most difficult part of inventing the wheel. It was the combination of a wheel and a fixed axle that allows the wheel to be connected to a stable platform that was critical. Without the fixed, fixed axle, the wheel's use is minimal. Otherwise, you've just got something like um, Game of Tiddlywinks. The wheels, the circles, you could just push around and flip around, but you cannot do constructive work. In order for constructive work to be done, like driving and a car or a conveyor belt or an escalator, you need to have that wheel connected by an axle, by a connecting rod. Or in the case of gears in a watch or a clock, that those gears, which are again wheels, need to have a fixed area. The center of the wheel has to be attached to something so that it doesn't slip while the uh, mechanism does its job. The compass was invented by the Chinese and the earliest is the earliest compasses were used around 200 BC. This is a relatively modern invention and some believe that this was first created for fortune telling and geomancy. If everyone if anyone is familiar with feng shui then the compass is very important in that technique. It's around the 11th century that it was adapted for navigational purposes. So the compass actually enabled mariners to navigate far from land safely, opening the world for exploration and subsequent development of global trade. It's still widely used today. The compass has transformed our knowledge and understanding of the earth forever. So where before we were walking around or horse and buggy and um, knew our directions by maybe landmarks or the stores, stars or the sun. Right now you don't need the sun because you have the uh, magnet, the compass that actually tells you which direction to go to. The steam engine. A Spanish mining administrator named Geronimo de Ayans is thought to have been the first to develop a steam engine. He patented a device that used steam power to pump water from mines. However, Englishman Thomas Savory, an engineer and inventor, is usually credited with developing the first practical steam engine in 1698. His device used steam pressure to draw water from flooded mines. Savory used principles set forth by Dennis Pepin, a French-born British physicist who invented the pressure cooker in the development of his engine. This technology ultimately provided the ability to move large-scale bodies of water easily, which allowed cities to expand in size. You may remember that in olden times, there was usually wells in cities that, and people walked to those wells and got water, brought them to home, used that pail of water, come back. So there was, there was a limited amount of water that was available to the cities, which means the cities could not be built and could not spread wider because water was not available. So once you make the availability of water automated, then the city could have lots more people because it could be supported by a larger supply of water. Now in, 18, in 1711, another Englishman, Thomas Newcomen, developed an improvement in the engine. Later in 1781, James Watt, a Scottish instrument maker, employed by Glasgow University, added a separate condenser to Newcomb's engine that allowed the steam cylinder to be maintained at a constant temperature. If you have a constant temperature, you also have a constant pressure. This dramatically improved its functionality. He later developed a double rotating steam engine that by the 1800s would power trains, mills, factories, and number 
numerous other manufacturing operations, jump-starting the Industrial Revolution. And of course, the world was never the same again. The automobile. Few inventions have had as profound an effect on the world as the automobile. Automobiles have revolutionized transportation, making it faster, more efficient, and more accessible to people around the world. Some people credit the birth of the modern car to the German inventor Carl Benz, who patented his Benz patent motorwagen in 1886. However, automobiles had been in the works since 1769, when Nicholas Joseph Cugno developed the first steam-powered automobile capable of human transportation. Over the years, many people contributed to the development of the automobile and its constituent parts. At the beginning of the 20th century, Henry Ford devised ways to make cars cheap enough for most people to buy. These techniques then became standard with, Gini, with General Motors and Chrysler following suit. So he devised the technique of the, um, of course, now I can't remember. The assembly line, sorry, the assembly line. And because the cars are not, previously the cars were put together by hand, meaning one individual or a couple of individuals or a team would put a car together. And each one of them was responsible for putting in some of the parts in that car. In the assembly line, each individual or each station was responsible for putting in a particular part in a particular place. And this allowed faster production and easier production and more, more cars were available and therefore became cheaper and more people were able to travel. Now, gasoline is a petroleum derived fuel. And of course, is a significant role in shaping the modern world. Without the gasoline, there would be no transportation industry as we know it today. Gasoline itself is a transparent crude oil derived liquid used as a fuel in internal combustion engines. Now, the first oil well was dug in the U.S. In, in the United States in 1859 in Pennsylvania. And this oil was refound to produce kerosene. The distillation process to get to kerosene also produced gasoline. However, nobody knew the use that could be made of gasoline, so it was thrown away and discarded as a byproduct. Actually, it was burned off. Later, it was discovered that the internal combustion engine ran best on light fuels, not kerosene, but gasoline. And the new process began to be used to produce gasoline more easily. Locomotives can carry many passengers without, with comfort while also being able to haul heavy loads over long distances. Although the history of modern train travel is just over 200 years old, tracks or rails have been used for carrying wagons since the 16th century. The first full-scale working railway steam locomotive built by Richard Trevithick, a British engineer, used high-pressure steam to drive the engine. On February 21st, 1801, was the marking of the world's first steam-powered railway journey when an unnamed steam locomotive called a train along the tramway in Wales. But Trevithnik's locomotives were too heavy for the cast iron plateway track then in use. The commercial appearance of train networks came in the 1820s, and in 1821, George Stevenson was appointed as an engineer for the construction of the Stockton and Darlington Railway in the northeast of England. And this was opened as the first public steam powered railway in 1825. In 1829, Stevenson built his famous steam engine, the rocket, and the age of the railway began. The airplane. 
the advent of human flight not only boosted our power of movement, but also enhanced our vision. We gained the ability to see the earth from above and our world forever changed. On December 17, 1903, Wilbur and Orville Wright completed the first powered, sustained, and controlled flight. This was a day that would be remembered for all time. Flying machines had been dreamt up since Leonardo da Vinci's time and probably long before that time. But thanks to the work of countless inventors over several centuries, the Wright brothers became the first to achieve controlled powered flight. So if they were constructed um, planes, as it were, like a kite, but this is a controlled flight, meaning the direction and the speed was controlled by the pilot. Beginning with their work on gliders, the duo's success laid the foundation for modern aeronautical engineering by demonstrating what was possible and the world became slow, smaller. So where before, it would seem that the world was huge because it was, sometimes it would take months for ships to cross the ocean to get from point A to point B. Now the plane, the airplane, gets us from point A to point B in hours. The transformation of communication. Communication itself is the exchange of information, of ideas and emotions between people or groups of people. There have been many discoveries and inventions that have transformed communication throughout history. Communication is constantly evolving and adapting to the needs and desires of people and society. Some of the most influential discoveries and inventions that have shaped com communication are the printing press. German goldsmith Johann Gutenberg is often credited with inventing the printing press around 1436, although he was far from the first to automate the book printing process. Woodblock printing in China dates from the 9th century, and the Korean bookmakers were printing with movable metal type a century before Gutenberg. Johann Gutenberg's machine, however, improved on the already existing press presses and introduced them to the West. By 1500, Gutenberg presses were operating throughout Western Europe, producing vast quantities of written materials from individual pages to pamphlets and books. With this movable type process, printing presses exponentially increased the speed with which books book copies could be made, and thus they led to the rapid and widespread dissemination of knowledge for the first time in history. I mean, some of you may remember the history where previously books are just, were extremely expensive and very rare because books themselves were copied by monks, by humans, letter by letter. And this took a long time, look, took a lot of effort. But now with the printing press, lots of books can be produced and made available to the populace. Morse code. The telegraph was developed between the 1830s and 1840s by Samuel Morse and other inventors. And it revolutionized long distance communication. The system itself works by sending electrical signals that are transmitted by a wire laid between stations. In addition, Samuel Morse and Alfred Vail developed a code, eventually called the Morse Code, for the simple transmission of messages across telegraph lines. Based on the frequency of usage, the code assisted the code assigned a set of dots or short marks and dashes long marks to the English alphabet and numbers. According to some scholars, the telegraph was instrumental in laying the foundation for modern com conveniences like telephones and computer code. The transistor is an essential component in nearly every modern electrical gadget, electronic gadget. Julius Littlefield patented a 
field effect transistor in 1926, but the working device was not feasible as it was. In 1947, John Bardeen, Walter Brat Bratain, and William Shockley developed the first practical transistor device at Bell Laboratories. The trio was awarded the 1956 Nobel Peace Prize in Nobel Prize in Physics for this invention. Transistors have since become a fundamental piece of the circuitry in countless electronic devices, including televisions, cell phones, and computers, making a remarkable impact on technology. And of course, we have the telephone. The history of the telephone conceivably started with a human desire to communicate far and wide. It wasn't enough for to wait for letters to be developed by um, a Pony Express or by people going from place to place. People needed a quicker and more reliable way to communicate between places. Mr. Watson, come here, I need you, were the first words ever spoken on a telephone, or so the story goes. Alexander Graham Bell, said them to his assistant, Thomas Watson, on March 10th, 1876. This moment would change, would change communications forever. With the arrival of the mobile phone in the 1980s, personal communication were no longer shackled to cables because previously had to be connected by some kind of a wire from point A to point B. With the mobile phone, you no longer had to be connected to a wire because things were picked up um, from the ether. Now the cell phone. The clever invention of the cellular network supported the revolution of the telephone industry. From bulky mobile phones to ultra-thin handsets, mobile phones have come a long way. John F. Mitchell and Martin Cooper of Motorola demonstrated the first handheld device in 1973, starting a technological revolution we still live in today. Soon it would be possible to hold conversations with another person and even multiple people at once from anywhere at any time. The ability to beam short text messages and later pictures and eventually emojis and videos would then follow. So cell phones have enabled people to stay connected even when they are far away and revolutionize the way we communicate, work, and access information. So when something is happening on the other side of the world, as long as a person has a cell phone, they then can take a picture, take a video, and that video can be spread um, from one person to another. But at least the information is captured and can be sent immediately. Email. We're all used to sending emails. We're all used to using t telephones and cell phones. But most developers of early mainframes and money computers developed similar but often incompatible mail applications. And over time, these became linked by a web of gateways and routing systems. Many, U many U.S. universities are part of the ARPANET, which increased software portability between its systems. Now, Roy Tomlinson itself is credited with inventing one common feature of the email system that we know today. And in 1972, while working on the Ar ARPANET contractor, Tomlinson used the at symbol to denote sending a message from one computer to another. Now, there's also transformation of milestones in the medical industry and transformation of medicine. Though some say that the biggest improvement, the biggest um, impact on medicine was the fact that people washed their, their hands and kept everything clean and sterile. Medical discoveries have changed the world in many ways, from preventing and curing diseases to improving the quality of and length of life to advancing science and technology. Following are some of the groundbreaking advances in medicine antibiotics. Antibiotics have saved millions of lives by killing and inhibiting the growth of harmful bacteria. 
Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch first described the use of antibiotic drugs in 1877. In 1928, Alexander Fleming noticed a bacteria-filled Petri dish on his laboratory with its lid accidentally ajar. Now, the Petri dish has been contaminated with mold. However, anywhere where the, where the mold was, the bacteria was dead. So it became, the antibiotic was then named penicillin after the chemist purified it. And throughout the 20th century, antibiotics spread rapidly and proved a significant living improvement, fighting nearly every known infection and producing and protecting people and people's health. You know, at this point, they have become somewhat, um, because the antibiotics are overused, some of the bacteria became resistant to antibiotics so right now, the antibiotic use is being scaled back to make sure that we don't produce a superbug. The X-ray. The development of the X-ray machine is undoubtedly one of the most impressive advancements in medicine. Like many famous inventions, the X-ray was discovered by accident by physicist William Conrad Röntgen while testing whether cathode rays could pass through some glass he noticed a glow from a nearly chemically coated, a nearby chemically coated screen. Because of the unknown nature of the rays, he named them X-rays. Through his observation, he learned that X-rays could pass through human tissues to show a clear picture of the skeleton and organs. These observations led to the development of radiology as we know it today and has helped in the diagnosis of broken bones, tumors, organ failures, and more. So where before, excuse me. Medical personnel could only see outside the body. The x-rays now gave medical personnel a view inside the body. Anesthesia. While the use of opium poppy and other herbal remedies as anesthetics date back to early civilization, the first public demonstration of modern anesthesia was on October 16, 1846, otherwise known as Ether Day. Now, William T. G. Morton and Surgeon John Collins Warren made anesthesia history at Massachusetts General Hospital with a successful use of di diethyl ether to prevent pain during surgery. Since this historic milestone, advancements in anesthesia administration and newer anesthetics led to the medical specialty of anesthesiology in the early 20th century. So it's important, especially after surgery and during surgery, for us not to be able to feel the pain. So anesthesia helps a lot. And these are some other milestones, the camera. Cameras have transformed the world in many ways. From the camera obscura to modern day digital cameras and camera phones. So the cameras are, ex ex it allowed us to capture scenes, to capture people, to make a history of what the family looked like now, Kodak launched the first mass marketed camera by Eastman in 1888. Stephen Sasson then later invented and built the first digital camera in 1975. So he built the first prototype of a camera using a handful of Motorola parts, 16 batteries, a movie camera lens, and newly invented Fairchild electronic sensors. However, cameras have advanced, and right now they became digital cameras. And of course, they help us record those memories you would like. The computer. There are so many ways that computers have contributed to the development of humanity. They help us solve complex problems, improve learning, and connect the, and connect the globe, to name a few. 
In the early 19th century, the father of the computer, Charles Babbage, conceptualized and invented the first machine that would compute table tables of numbers. From those first tentative stages, let's, the journey to the modern computer began. And everyone by this time is becoming to the point, is coming to the point where everyone on the planet will have access to a computer, the internet. Like other inventions, the internet cannot be attributed to one individual. Instead, it has evolved and originated in the 1950s, along with the development of computers. The first workable prototype of the internet came in the late 1960s with the creation of ARPANET or the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network. ARPANET adopted a TCP IP protocol in 1983 and from there, researchers began to assemble the network of networks that became the modern internet. Now, the internet itself is a networking infrastructure, whereas the World Wide Web is a way to access information over the internet medium. Tim Berners-Lee, a British computer scientist and legend, is known as the father of the World Wide Web. The web was initially conceived and developed to meet the demand for automated information sharing between scientists in universities and institutes worldwide. Tim Berners-Lee wrote the proposals for the World Wide Web in March of 1989 and in May 1990. Berners-Lee worked with Belgian systems engineer Robert Calio to formalize the proposal, including describing a World Wide Web in which hypertext documents could be viewed by browsers. By the end of the 1990, Berner-Lee had the first web server and browser up and running at the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Only a few users had access to this computer platform that ran the browser, so development soon began on a new browser which could run on any system. Now, humans have made a lasting and permanent mark on the planet through their discoveries and inventions, changing the course of history. The printing press revolutionized the way information was disseminated, while the steam engine powered the Industrial Revolution. The internet has transformed the way we communicate and access information, while the cell phones have made it possible to stay connected with people from anywhere in the world. However, not only has our world gone through a scientific and technological evolution leading to discoveries and inventions, it has also gone through a spiritual evolution guided by the sacred texts leading to changes in our consciousness, energy, evolution, and knowledge levels. Humanity has evolved through time with all the sacred texts from the philosophies of the Far East, the Old Testament, the Psalms of David, the New Testament, and the Quran that have been assembled in the knowledge book. From fascicle number 20, quote, its mission is universal and religious unification. The essence of the book is the unification of all the religious books, explanation of the truth and a call to the golden age. Knowledge transfer from dimension unknown to the world dimension. Each of the previous sacred texts were milestones in humanity's evolution. Each sacred text, building on the foundation of the previous sacred text, gradually allowed humanity to elevate their evolution, energy, consciousness, and knowledge levels. So step by step, easily by following whatever prescription was given by each of the sacred texts, for the type of practice, the type of formal worship that was um, presented allowed humans to gradually go from the world dimension, which is a zero frequency, third world dimension, to right now the 18th evolution dimension, 72nd energy dimension. So the Knowledge Book is a book of cosmic light. It is your key of awakening, and it prepares you for the unknown dimensions. It is the introduction to and the preparation for the Golden Age and the Age of Light. 
the cosmic energies and knowledge that is given by the knowledge book are the keys that unlock the dimensions previously unavailable to humanity. Humanity has reached another milestone on its evolution path. Following the path designed in the knowledge book, humanity will gradually, safely, and quickly uni unite in peace and harmony at the dimension of central suns. And this is it for this week. Sorry, it's been a bit rushed. We have, I guess, overstuffed the slides. So MMJP99 is my email address. 973-787-7035 is my telephone. So please email, text any questions you may have or any suggestions you may have. Um, we'll talk again next month. Please take care and stay safe. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Potasik. Marge was led to the Knowledge Book, a gift to humanity at its time of transition to the golden age that provides the truth, energies, and knowledge. Now she shares information from and answers questions about the Knowledge Book with you the fourth Tuesday each month at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more information, visit usa.theknowledgebook.net and tune in next time for another amazing show on Knowledge Book Radio.